Sir Isaac Newton. This most elegant system of suns and planets could only arise from the purpose and sovereignty of an intelligent and mighty being. He rules them all as the sovereign Lord of all things. Albert Einstein. The harmony of natural law reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking of human beings is utterly insignificant. Werner von Braun. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be design and purpose behind it all. Through a closer look at creation, we ought to gain a better knowledge of the Creator. Their words ring out across the boundaries of time and space. Brilliant minds filled with awe by the matchless brilliance of the Creator's hand. Plato, Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, each drawing inspiration from the order and artistry of what they beheld. Galileo, Kepler, Nicholas Copernicus, And as they looked up into a universe where the stars outnumbered the grains of sand on all the ocean shores, the wonder of God's work would shine not only through the infinite cosmos that filled their eyes, but from the very creation upon which they stood, a remarkable planet called Earth. The planet Earth. Since the beginning of time, its very existence in the universe has endured as a source of mystery and wonder from one generation to the next. A thousand years before the birth of Christ, the Hebrew shepherd David looked into the heavens, and like countless others on nights both past and yet to come, was filled with awe for the world God had made. How many are thy works, O Lord! In wisdom you made them all. In the beginning, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. One generation will commend thy works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts, your works are wonderful, and I know that full well.
the astronauts are often accused of not being able to express themselves very well when they come back about really what it's like to be up in space. And I think there's a reason for that. I think because when you look down at the Earth, you know, the word that comes to my mind is awesome. You just are so completely surrounded by the majesty of God and his creation. For 11 years, Colonel Guy Gardner was an astronaut in the United States space program. He flew two missions in the space shuttle. Yeah, on my first space shuttle mission, uh, we had a very busy first day, uh, exciting first day, but no time to really pause and reflect on where you were, <laughs> what you were doing, and the uniqueness of it all. But the, that night, as we got ready for bed, uh, Hoot, the commander, and I uh, slept in our seats up on the flight deck. Uh, we just kind of floated above the seats with the seat belts loosely fastened around us to keep us from drifting off in the night. But as we drifted off to sleep, you could look out the windows, and we were in an attitude where the Earth was going directly below us out the front windows of the shuttle. And to look down and reflect on everything that is down below you within your field of view was just an incredible experience. You know, the, the tears well up in my eyes as I'm looking out at this awesome view. And of course, in zero gravity, they don't roll down your cheek. They just kind of bubble up on your eye, and you can't see anymore. Uh, just an awesome experience, really beyond words. The more we've learned about our solar system, the more unique the Earth appears to us. We have sent probes out to study the other planets in our solar system. Some have even gone beyond our solar system. We have intensely studied the planets with ground-based telescopes, as well as telescopes from orbit around the Earth. And yet the more we learn and see about our universe, the more we come to realize that the most ideally suited place for life within the entire solar system and perhaps the entire universe is the planet that we call home. While considering the Creator and His handiwork, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah wrote, He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. Today, our planet is home to more than a million different species of life, diverse, sometimes exotic, and each reliant upon an extraordinary system of conditions and provisions that ensure their survival. Let us explore just a few of the countless miracles that make life possible. For to understand how the Earth supports its inhabitants is to see more clearly the character and attributes of its creator. It has been called the most important substance in the universe, a chemical treasure flowing freely, perhaps nowhere else but planet Earth. The product of two atoms of hydrogen bonded to one of oxygen. Shaper of continents, controller of climate, and no living thing can exist without it, the water of life. The Earth has been blessed with a liquid treasure. Seventy percent of the planet is covered by more than 326 million cubic miles of water. In fact, if the Earth was perfectly smooth, its waters would submerge the land to an average depth of 8,500 feet. Colorless, odorless, and without taste. At the same time, supremely ordinary and spectacular. And daily, it touches every facet of our lives. 
It takes about 200 gallons of water to make a single loaf of bread. 700 gallons to refine a barrel of petroleum. 2,500 gallons to provide a pound of beef. And more than 40,000 gallons to build one automobile. But as impressive as these figures are, the importance of water is perhaps best revealed by this fact. More than 60% of every human body is H2O. Twenty-five hundred years ago, Thales of Miletus, the father of Greek philosophy, taught that the earth was sustained by water. As we now know, his premise was quite accurate. But what is it that really makes this priceless resource so unique and vital? Throughout both nature and the laboratories of science, the answers abound. It has long been recognized that water is the most remarkable solvent on Earth. To demonstrate this ability, more than a cup of sugar is poured into a beaker already filled to the brim with water. Surprisingly, instead of overflowing, the liquid totally dissolves the sugar without affecting the water level. Given enough time, water will dissolve almost any other substance. Its significance as the universal solvent is graphically displayed in the process of erosion. Every time a water drop falls to earth, it dissolves and collects molecules of chemicals, nutrients, and minerals. In fact, nearly half of the world's known elements are found in its waters. Without this ongoing process of collection, the Earth's land-based plant life would cease to exist. For only as nutrients are dissolved in water can they be absorbed and consumed by the vegetation of our planet. Yet through erosion, water's work as an agent of collection and supply is only partially complete. After the chemicals and minerals are dissolved, they must be transported to the food-producing structures of a plant. A trip into space reveals some unexpected clues into how this task is accomplished. One of the fun things to do uh, when we're up in space in a weightless environment, in zero gravity, is to play with your food, particularly the liquids. And water up in space doesn't flow because there's no gravity to cause it to do that. Instead, it forms a little bubble whenever you put your lips up on it and try to suck it in. If it's of any size at all, instead of all just coming in your mouth, it'll kind of stick all over your face and get up your nose and, and cause you to spit and sputter as you're trying to drink it. Back on Earth, Water's ability to form a liquid skin is only slightly less visible. On a damp morning, trillions of water molecules cling together to create these droplets. This phenomenon, known as surface tension, also enables a water strider to walk on top of a pond. And beads of liquid to roll off the backs of these coots. Yet every day, surface tension's greatest role in creation is probably carried out here. Capillarity, the force that causes water to rise within a constricted space, is constantly at work throughout the plant kingdom. As water's surface tension and the liquid's attraction to a solid material, in this case the glass tube, draw the fluid upward. To illustrate this principle, the stem of a white carnation is split and placed into containers of colored water. The time-lapse camera accelerates our view of the process. If water was unable to creep upward, away from the pull of gravity, 
The chemicals and minerals plants must have to manufacture food would remain in the soil, eventually breaking the chain of life vital to most of the planet's organisms. How effectively can water be raised within a plant? Consider that for more than 2,000 years, capillarity and a host of other forces have worked to lift at least a ton of water to the top of each of these redwood giants every day. For rugged splendor and power, few places on Earth can rival Alaska's Glacier Bay National Park. Here, mountains of solid ice rise hundreds of feet above the sea, often calving or breaking away under their own weight. Nearly three-fourths of the world's fresh water supply is locked in polar ice caps and glaciers like these. And beyond their majestic presence, they stand as vivid examples of yet another unique property of water, vital to life on Earth. In the days when the milkman delivered his product in a glass bottle, freezing temperatures often produced an unexpected effect. Again, the time-lapse camera speeds up our view of the action. Milk is 87% water, and it's the water in the milk that has frozen and expanded. Almost any other substance, like this melted paraffin, whether solid, liquid, or gas, will shrink in volume as its temperature goes down, and as it shrinks, it becomes more dense. Water also shrinks during most of the temperature drop toward the freezing point. But below 40 degrees, something amazing happens. Water expands and becomes less dense. As it freezes into a solid, its density continues to decrease until it has finally gained about 9% in volume. This is the reason ice floats. It occupies more space than liquid water without weighing anymore. Since ice floats on the surface, it acts as a layer of insulation, protecting the water and life below from freezing. Now, if water acted like other liquids and became more dense when frozen, ice would sink, and more ice would be formed on the surface. In the winter, the rivers and streams would freeze and stop flowing. Lakes would freeze solid, and eventually, a disastrous chain reaction could cause even the oceans to become locked in ice. Warmer temperatures would melt only a thin layer of surface ice, forming a shallow slush. Lack of flowing water and intolerable extremes in climate would render the planet uninhabitable. But God created Earth to sustain life, and in his wisdom, orchestrated each detail necessary for survival. Daily, more than 10,000 thunderstorms explode across the planet, most of them releasing more power than a 100-kiloton nuclear bomb. A storm like this, 
is one step in a cycle that results in the purification and distribution of the Earth's fresh water supply. This hydrologic, or water cycle, is an incredible machine, generating more power each day than man has been able to produce throughout the course of history. Let's follow its course for yet another glimpse of God's continuing care for the Earth. To understand the water cycle, we must first look to its main theater of operation. 97% of the Earth's water supply is stored in its oceans. In order to serve the majority of the planet's inhabitants, two dramatic events must routinely occur. Salt must be removed from the seawater and the water then transported throughout the Earth. Powered by the heat of the sun, both objectives are accomplished. As liquid water is transformed into a gas, leaving the salt behind, it rises vapor-like into the air. At daybreak, a similar action can be observed from a lake or riverbank. Annually, about 95,000 cubic miles of water are drawn into the atmosphere through evaporation, and in the process, one of creation's most wondrous spectacles fills the skies. A cloud is actually an ingenious vessel of transport. Comprised of water droplets, they are easily carried across the planet by prevailing winds. As the clouds rise higher into the air, they cool and later contract, squeezing out their life-giving cargo. Remarkably, since the day of their creation, the waters of the Earth have neither grown nor diminished in volume. In fact, the same water you used to wash your car last weekend may have lapped upon the shores of the Nile during the reign of the pharaohs. For throughout history, our liquid treasure has been purified and recycled to be used again and again. 2,000 years before the principles involved were discovered by science, one of the earliest accounts of the water cycle was written in the scriptures. All the rivers run into the sea, but the sea is not full. Unto the place from where they came, they return again. A flowing gift lifeblood of the kingdoms of plant, animal, and man. Yet life on Earth is hardly the complete result of an instant recipe that reads, just add water. To understand why, we need look no farther than the moon. Altitude 4200, you're a go for landing, over. I turn it there and go for landing, 3,000 feet. Shot alarm. That's 30 feet down, two and a half. A mere 240,000 miles away, the only life to ever stand on the barren face of our nearest neighbor came in the form of our own astronauts. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down. Okay, Houston, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. Roger, roger, Falcon. I was strolling on the moon one day 
Their explorations revealed conclusively that the moon is 100% dead, unable to support the smallest organism. Even if water could somehow be added to the lunar surface, nothing could survive, for there is far more to life on a celestial body than rivers, oceans, and rain. The Creator's formula for life on Earth involves a multitude of factors and ingredients all working together in precise balance. Solomon, king of Israel, once proclaimed that the Lord, by wisdom, hath established the earth. In light of recent scientific discovery concerning our planet and the rest of the solar system, the ancient king's insight appears increasingly profound. Consider the Earth's distance from the sun, 93 million miles. Not surprisingly, this distance has an enormous effect on the planet's climate. Our special relationship to our primary source of heat and light positioned neither too close nor too far away, has resulted in a very comfortable average global temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Even in the planet's most severe environments, including the 130 degree heat of the Sahara Desert and the frigid climes of Antarctica, a large variety of organisms thrive quite well. On our nearest planetary neighbor, Venus, however, conditions are drastically different. Often called the Earth's twin because of its similar size, Venus orbits the Sun at an average distance of only 67 million miles. Surrounded by a suffocating atmosphere, daily temperatures here soar to over 900 degrees, hot enough to melt lead. While on Jupiter, with an orbital distance of nearly 484 million miles, temperatures hover around 200 degrees below zero. The hope of finding life on this, the largest of planets in our solar system, has all but vanished. If we point a time-lapse camera toward the North Star, the resulting footage reveals another critical provision for life on Earth. The apparent motion of the stars is the result of the Earth's rotation on its axis. It spins 360 degrees once every 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. A moderate rate, when compared to most of the other planets, it proves ideal for in the course of each day, the entire global surface is properly warmed and cooled. The significance of planetary rotation is underscored by a look at Mercury. Traveling in the closest orbit to the sun, it rotates completely on its axis only once every 59 Earth days resulting in prolonged conditions of both devastating heat and stifling cold. As on Venus and Jupiter, the possibility for life here now seems non-existent. Despite formidable obstacles, the search for life beyond the Earth has long captivated human imagination. And for many years, the greatest hope for success centered here upon Mars. The fourth planet from the Sun, Mars possesses some striking similarities to the Earth, including an almost identical rate of rotation and angle of axis. Many astronomers believed that frozen water could be found in the Martian poles, and that the large channels apparent on its surface were once carved by flowing rivers. In 1976, however, Hope turned into disappointing reality 
as the Viking spacecrafts explored, photographed, and collected soil samples from what appears to be another dead and sterile world. Most scientists now feel that Mars is a place of total desolation and waste, too far from the sun, too cold, and without a gravitational pull strong enough to contain one of the most vital components of all, a life-sustaining atmosphere. One of the things that really strikes me when I look out at the Earth, particularly out at the horizon as we're going around the Earth from space, and you can see the same thing in pictures that we bring back from space, is when you look at the Earth's atmosphere, just this very, very thin band of blue out there against this enormous planet, and you realize just how fragile it is and how special it is that this little layer is just right for the life that it takes care of down below on the Earth. It has been said of the Earth that the existence of its inhabitants hinges upon a thin and delicate sheath of gas that envelops the planet like the skin of an apple. Our atmosphere, more than 99% of which extends less than 50 miles above the planet's surface, is primarily comprised of 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen. This mixture seems almost perfect for life, while at the same time acting as a protective shield from the deadly radiation of the sun. By way of contrast, the barren meteor-scarred surface of the moon provides a vivid picture of what the absence of an atmosphere can mean. Yet in the Creator's formula for life, even this dead satellite of the Earth plays a crucial role in our survival. The rise and fall of the ocean's tides is actually controlled by the moon's gravitational pull. If it was much closer to the Earth, or significantly larger, devastating tidal waves could submerge large areas of the continents. Move the moon too far from the Earth, however, and tidal motion would cease, causing water to stagnate along the coastlines. In either case, life as we know it would be dramatically impacted. As inhabitants of the Earth, we are passengers aboard a unique and remarkable spacecraft. For inherent in our planet's design are a myriad of attributes and characteristics at work in a harmony unmatched in the solar system. And daily they unfold before us while sustaining the existence of every living thing. An abundance of flowing water and a favorable pattern of climate. Fertile soil, suitable for agriculture. Ocean tides that cleanse the shorelines. A life-supporting atmosphere filled with clouds that transport a liquid treasure. An ideal size and gravitational pull. A protective magnetic field. The optimum location in the solar system. They are ingredients in a matchless formula, the absence or change in any one of which could prove catastrophic. Stop and consider the wonders of him who is perfect in knowledge. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He did not create a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. In the first chapter of Genesis, we read that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And when you look down at the earth and when you look at creation, you see that not only was it an incredible design functionally, that everything fits together and works, but there's also this enormous beauty in what you look at. To start out over the jungles of Africa and look down on the beauty of the jungles and the coastlines and the deserts and then a few minutes later be flying up over the snow-covered mountains in, in Siberia is just incredible. 
And it's just beautiful to look down on it with its myriad of colors and the waters and the land masses and the, at the horizon with the beautiful thin blue line of the Earth's atmosphere. Watching sunrises and sunsets uh, coming up through the atmosphere and going down. You're just overcome with the immense beauty of this creation. That God not only created a place that we can live in, but he created a place that we can enjoy and enjoy fully. Aristotle once noted that beauty is the gift of God, while the Italian poet Dante echoed, all of nature is his art. From the subtle beauty of the aurora borealis to the ornate pattern etched upon a seashell, every corner of creation is a visual showcase, sculpted, colored, and formed to light the eyes of the beholder. Consider the snowflakes that fall to earth on a winter's day and the number of winter days in the lifetime of our planet. When photographed through a microscope, we marvel at the intricate design and craftsmanship incorporated into every flake. Each is built upon the same six-sided framework, yet each is different. And as far as we know, no two snowflakes have ever been found to be exactly alike. Their beauty serves no practical purpose. God could have allowed their formation to result in the same shapeless mass. Yet instead, he chose to create a gallery of countless individual masterpieces. It is in contemplating beauty's existence that we see a more complete picture of the Creator. For it seems that the earth was not only designed to support life, but also to bring pleasure to the people who live there. Both of these objectives were described in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And he made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Since the first signs of vegetation pushed their way through the soil, many of the most brilliant displays of the beauty and sustenance to be drawn from the earth have been revealed in the plant kingdom. More than 300,000 different species of plants paint the earth with a living mural. They are the source of food, clothing, and shelter. Medicines are derived from their stalks and roots. Most of the oxygen we breathe is released from their leaves. Like water, the atmosphere, and the magnetic field, they are special creations, integral threads in the fabric of our living planet. To explore even briefly any facet of their existence is to behold yet another view of the wonders of the earth. As a flower opens its petals to the world, the curtain rises on a timeless drama. Beyond their beauty, they labor as living machines for the production of seeds. And in their critical task rests not only the next generation of roses or daffodils, but the ultimate survival of every living thing. 
Observe how a seed is formed in an Iceland poppy. Each of the dust-like grains of pollen on the anthers of this flower contains half of the genetic blueprint for a fully developed plant. As a honeybee collects and then transfers pollen to the top of the poppy's female reproductive organ, the pistil, a fascinating and rarely observed sequence of events is set into motion. Through the window of the microscope and time-lapse camera, let's take a closer look at a single pollen grain. Triggered by moisture, the grain germinates and sends a thread-like tube downward toward the interior of the pistil. Its destination, the poppy's ovary. Here, within an enclosed chamber, hundreds of ovules await one of creation's most awesome moments. Again, through the microscope, watch as the union of pollen and ovule is actually revealed. Growing steadily, the tube is drawn directly to the wall of a single, unfertilized ovule, and the spark of life is ignited. As the flower fades, both the ovary and its contents mature, and the pod that remains silently declares the seed's formation is complete. For the vast majority of the world's vegetation, a ripened cone, fruit, or pod will proclaim a similar miracle. And when the time is right, they will present to the world a living treasury of seeds. They are packages of life, each holding the embryo of a living plant and the promise of a new generation. Locked within their shells are the cornfields of Iowa and the rainforests of Brazil. Yet to successfully release their enormous potential, they must first reach an environment suitable for growth. The stage is set for the seed to enter the world. The journey of seed to soil is a cornerstone of life on Earth, and often it is empowered by human hands. In an attempt to satisfy the universal needs for food, clothing, and shelter, countless millions of tons of seeds are harvested and dispersed each year. Through the timeless endeavor of agriculture, our countrysides and continents are filled with vast oceans of vegetation. And regardless of the methods or technologies employed, one fact remains constant. The survival and advancement of civilization is linked directly to the incredible power of the seed. But beyond the realm of machines and human toil, a very different story unfolds. For it is here, among the sometimes overlooked majority of the world's seed-bearing plants, that spectacular displays of both design and purpose become moment-by-moment -moment occurrences. Throughout nature, the simple act of a seed's dispersal holds life and death significance. To survive, each must ultimately reach an environment with adequate food, 
water, and space to grow, a place most often found beyond the shadow of the parent plant. In its quest, the seed may travel a few inches or halfway around the world. But regardless of the distance, in the provisions that make their journeys possible, the Creator's power is uniquely displayed. To catch a glimpse, a man need look no farther than to the grass at his feet. In a field of wild oats, the seed's provision for travel is both surprising and remarkably effective. For the next few moments, keep your eyes fixed on the slender filaments attached to the end of every seed. They're called awns, and each is a mechanism highly sensitive to changes in humidity. Watch closely as alternating cycles of moisture and heat are added to their environment. First, the damp air triggers a reaction, and the awns respond by winding up tightly. Then when the air dries out, they react to the change and unwind. After a few days of this continual twisting, both awn and seed work their way off the plant. But being earthbound does nothing to change their response to the weather, and an amazing journey begins. The time-lapse camera speeds up the action, but what you are seeing really happens. The twisting awns actually propel the wild oat seeds along the ground, and the mechanics involved are remarkable. As the awns push their cargo forward, Thin hairs growing from the sides of the seed keep it from sliding back. Then when gravity tilts the seed nose first, the awns demonstrate another facet of their versatility as they plant their cargo into the soil. After studying the wild oat, one botanist noted, it must not be assumed there is any directing brain within these seeds. Of course he was correct. But after watching them for a while, it's not hard to see why there just might be reason to wonder. In a patch of oxalis, the provisions for dispersal take on different, but no less ingenious dimensions. Standing less than an inch in height, this slender capsule may well be a resident of your own backyard. It is a fruit formed from an oxalis flower, the storehouse for more than two dozen seeds. This time, focus your attention on the outer layer of tissue surrounding each of them, as the time-lapse and high-speed cameras capture the essence of these living machines. When the seeds are ripe, their thin outer layer loses moisture and contracts. Simultaneously, an inner layer of tissue absorbs water, swelling to twice its normal size. Under tremendous pressure, the outer layer splits violently, squeezing the seeds through slits in the fruit at speeds exceeding 30 miles per hour. Life is literally shot into the world. For the Scotch broom, native to Western Europe and common throughout the Pacific coast of North America, the mechanisms for dispersal are even more dynamic. When the plant's yellow flowers die back, the pods that remain are gradually prepared to distribute their seeds. Throughout the summer months, the maturing pods are exposed to prolonged periods of heat. 
As the weeks pass, they dry out, and extreme tension builds within their walls. It is the prelude to one of nature's most explosive overtures. force of the scotch broom's exploding pods can launch its seeds more than 50 feet. Minute specks cast into an immense and hazardous world. A world where the obstacles to survival are sometimes staggering in scope. Yet the creator's provision for the dispersal of the Earth's vegetation is more than equal to the challenge of wind, water, and fire. In fact, often the very forces that could destroy the seed play a pivotal role in sustaining the cycle of ongoing life. This continuing drama of trial and survival is revealed in the Odyssey of the Coconut. Weighing several pounds, this remarkable vessel is constructed to withstand journeys of more than 1,000 miles in the open sea. One of the world's largest seeds, the coconut is well equipped for the hardships of aquatic travel. The key to the coconut's survival lies in its air-filled outer husk. By itself, the edible seed would become waterlogged and sink after only a few days. But when encased in a buoyant, fibrous container, it can remain afloat for more than a year, its embryonic plant protected from the deadly salt water. The conditions are severe. Yet the coconut is not only designed to survive the ocean's waves and currents, it can ultimately depend on them to transport life to a distant shore. The balance of life on Earth sometimes hinges upon the most unlikely of relationships. In a forest of knob cone pines, the importance of natural forces to the dispersal of the seed reaches its apex. Throughout the Pacific Northwest, the knob cone pine is known to produce some of the world's hardest and most protective cones. 
Growing in clusters around the limbs, these curiously shaped vessels possess a quality shared by few others. They refuse to open and release their seeds from one year to the next. Instead, like impenetrable fortresses, they remain sealed, strong enough to withstand the blows of a hammer and a forest of seed-hungry predators. Even time and weather fail to take their toll, as each cone's vice-like grip holds fast, often for decades. With rare exception, in all of nature, only one force is strong enough to break their hold. The searing heat of a forest fire triggers an amazing chain of events, and the cones begin to crack. By opening only partially and emitting a gaseous vapor, most of the seeds are insulated from the killing flames. Only when the fire has passed will the charred cones open fully. The miracle of a forest rebirth then takes its course. Crafted, sculpted, and engineered to sustain life. A remarkable planet called Earth. You know, the space shuttle is an incredibly complex vehicle. But then when you compare the space shuttle with Earth and life on Earth, you realize that the shuttle is nothing compared to the complexity of the planet we live on. I uh, have worked with the space shuttle program closely over several years and working with all the many different people who have a part to play in the design and operation of the shuttle always astounds me that all can come together for a successful shuttle launch. Tens of thousands of people have worked to design and build all the parts. I've traveled around and watched a small percentage of that of people doing their work, installing tiles on the bottom of the shuttle, designing electrical circuits for the many, many different computers and equipment that are used to operate the shuttle. And you look at it and there's no way that you could think that this thing happened by chance, that just by accident this amazing piece of machinery assembled itself. Uh, it's kind of like looking at the planet that we live on, the universe we live in, and the much, much more detailed and complex than a space shuttle, as complex as a space shuttle is. And when you look at life, the more you learn about how detailed a mechanism it is, it's very hard then to think that this also must have happened by chance. And you realize at the same time then that there had to be a master designer, a creator of this planet. And to me, that makes life all the more special because that tells me that instead of me being something that it was just come along in the course of time, live and die, that instead of 
a meaningless existence, that I have someone who cares for me, who has made me and cares about me, and someone I can go to with my troubles and my cares and my joys.
lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. The words have transcended more than 3,000 years with a message that will endure forever. Time and again, the writers of Scripture look to the world around them to help describe the most extraordinary bond in the universe, the personal relationship between the God of creation and anyone who will accept him as Lord. The promises bring lasting and familiar images to mind. You shall have peace like a river. The righteous will shine like the sun. I have wiped away your transgressions like a thick cloud. And as we reflect upon both the miracle of creation and the truth of God's word, the accounts of his love, care, and a new way of living often become even richer and more meaningful. Travel with us now on a spiritual odyssey, a journey filled with the glories of the Creator's heart as well as His hand, and experience, perhaps in a new way, the presence and fellowship of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out unto all the earth, their words to the ends of the earth. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing.
He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Have you not heard? It is he, God, who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. How majestic is your name in all the earth. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store food away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well.
Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. Your arm is endued with power. Your hand is strong, your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Praise be to the Lord forever.
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not faint.
Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Surely he is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord is my strength and my song, and with joy I will draw water from the wells of salvation. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come without money and without cost, for the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Feast on the abundance of your house, O God. You give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him living water, welling up to eternal life.
Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. For the old has gone, and the new has come. And the Lord said, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For he has saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior.
I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. Drip down, O heavens, from above, and let the clouds pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and salvation bear fruit, for I, the Lord, have created it. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. perfect peace, him whose mind is steadfast, because he trusts in you. Therefore I say, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord is the rock eternal.
Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The waters are his, for he made them, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. But I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor. In your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters. Do not let the floodwaters engulf me or the depths swallow me up. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me.
For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. For he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in my trust. The Apostle Paul wrote that since the beginning of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from the things he has made. Throughout history, whenever man has paused to contemplate the marvels of the physical universe, he has more often than not been filled with a deep sense of wonder and awe, and in the process, come face to face with the reality of his creator. And every day, through the revelation of the created world and the word of God, the unmistakable reality of the Lord's presence, power, and love shines brightly for all to see and know. How many are thy works, O Lord! In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your riches. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Yeah. 